You are listening to Shanghai Spies, written and presented by Mark Felton. Episode one. In Shanghai, on the morning of the eighth of December, nineteen forty-one, a group of extremely nervous middle-aged men had just been informed through a contact at the British Embassy that war was about to be declared. Most had been up all night, unable to rest, an unpleasant feeling churning through their stomachs. They had glanced at silver-framed photos of loved ones in their studies or atop drawing-room pianos, glanced out of the windows of their large and comfortable houses and apartments at the darkness until official confirmation had arrived just after daybreak. The Japanese were at war with Britain and America. William Gand was a 55-year-old wine and champagne salesman whose firm, W. J. Gand, was well known throughout the international settlement, where it supplied all of high society's grandest parties and soirees. Gand was the leader of a covert group of patriots in Shanghai, who were about to have their worlds turned upside down. John Brand was a 52-year-old businessman. Joseph Brister, 56, a company manager. George Jack, fifty-five, a life insurance company manager, and Sidney Riggs, a forty-nine-year-old surveyor, all middle-aged and used to comfortable lives. This unlikely gathering of men who shared a common background and schooling had been expecting to open a new front in Shanghai against the Germans and the Italians, who were present in the city in large numbers, and also keep a weather eye on the Japanese. Early in 1941, July, I was approached by W. M. Gand and asked if I would assist with certain secret service work. Recalled New Agent Sidney Riggs, directed, of course, towards the war effort and aimed primarily against Axis interests. By such direct and almost schoolboyish methods, Gand went about recruiting his agents. He knew he could rely on their patriotism, but clearly they did not really understand what they were getting themselves involved with. I willingly agreed," said Riggs, "to do all in my power in conjunction with others of the group, adding that he was offered fifty pounds as an incentive, which he waived as he was paid well enough as a surveyor. The amateur nature of the organisation is revealed by Riggs. We were pledged each to the other to refer only to each other by code names. Even though they knew one another socially, adding that although other people were co-opted to assist the group, they acted in a strictly unofficial capacity, and although the official group knew of their existence, we adopted the policy of not allowing them to be known to each other. Two more agents were added. Edward Elias was a forty-one-year-old stockbroker. An Irishman, William Clark, was a former deputy commissioner of the Shanghai Municipal Police, and at sixty-five, the oldest agent. These seven men formed Britain's belated attempt at a military sabotage and intelligence group in Shanghai, and were called OM, standing for Oriental Mission Shanghai, by their masters at Special Operations Executive in Singapore and London. For over a year, these patriotic but largely untrained spies had lived double lives. By day, they were respectable pillars of the international settlements British community, but in the shadowy hours of twilight, they had banded together to plot and scheme, always hoping to strike a blow for king and country in Shanghai, seemingly far removed from the war. It all seemed a million miles from the real shooting match in Europe and North Africa. And many in the British community had been stung by accusations from London that they were living high on the hog, safe in Shanghai, where their countrymen risked everything in the battle against Hitler and Mussolini. O M Shanghai had been formed specifically to counter such accusations. But on that chilly December morning, the seven members of O M Shanghai suddenly realised their inadequacies, their lack of tradecraft. And the danger of their being exposed, safes were emptied and files burned to cover their tracks and distance themselves from association with S O E. The Japanese reputation for brutality was well earned after the rape of Nanking in 
The men of OM Shanghai all knew that they were now targets for the dreaded Kempei Tai, the Japanese military police, whose use of torture was already infamous. They were trapped in Shanghai, far from any effective assistance from headquarters, and abandoned by their bosses in Japanese-occupied Shanghai. What was about to happen to them was worse than anything they could have imagined. When Winston Churchill had ordered the formation of a new sabotage organization with orders to set Europe ablaze after the Dunkirk evacuations in 1940, the Special Operations Executive had been born. The group's task was to link up with resistance organizations inside Europe and carry out acts of subversion and sabotage against the Germans. SOE was placed under the auspices of the Minister for Economic Warfare, Hugh Dalton, and remained separate from Britain's existing pre-war intelligence departments, MI5, and the Secret Intelligence Service, MI6. The MI stands for Military Intelligence, and today MI5 is tasked with dealing with intelligence threats inside the United Kingdom, whereas MI6 operates abroad. SOE was something new and untested, designed specifically for the war. It was viewed with great suspicion by the established intelligence organizations and their leaders. By late 1940, it was obvious in London that the Far East was going to be an important new front. Dalton was asked to create an SOE section for the Orient. SOE had experienced great difficulties in establishing operations inside German-controlled France, and decided to act quickly in creating a similar organization on the ground in the Far East before an expected Japanese takeover became a reality. SOE agent A. E. Jones was dispatched to Singapore in January 1941, charged with establishing a headquarters and a regional organization. Jones was ordered to appoint a number one in Shanghai, who would be responsible for all of northern China, an area of great economic importance to Britain at the time. In May 1941, a permanent head of OM was appointed, and Jones became the organization's second in command. SOE chose as head a man who was well known among the international business community in Shanghai. A former vice chairman of Imperial Chemical Industries, or ICI, and a former member of the exclusive Shanghai Municipal Council, Valentine Killery. Killery assumed the code name O100 and set up his office in Singapore. He was commissioned a lieutenant colonel in the army and created what became known as Special Training School, or STS 101. But perhaps its former name best summed up its true purpose. The School of Demolitions. The two top instructors in unorthodox warfare at the school were pre-war adventurer and mountaineer Major Freddie Spencer Chapman and tough Royal Marine Colonel Alan Cocky Warren. They created stay-behind parties of demolition and ambush specialists in Malaya should the Japanese capture the peninsula. Kaleri's knowledge of the local expatriate business community led him to recruit his agents from among his contemporaries at the exclusive Shanghai Club. These men were very different from the young, tough, and energetic soldiers being put through STS 101 in Singapore. It was perhaps not the best source from which to recruit personnel, as all would certainly attract the attention of the Kempei Tai as soon as the Japanese captured the international settlement. By dint of being prominent enemy personages, they could also expect to be swiftly interned by the Japanese, as they were relieved of their business assets and their liberty. It was doubtful how useful these men would have proved to SOE stuck inside an internment camp. Killery faced many challenges in making OM a success, not the least of which was his complete lack of experience in espionage work. MI6 operated its own agents throughout Asia, and along with the British diplomatic community, it remained very wary of Killery's collection of amateur spies, gentlemen adventurers, and would-be saboteurs. According to the official, though unpublished, history of OM Shanghai, MI6 made life as difficult as possible for Gand and his associates. 
OM telegrams to the Shanghai representative had to pass through the hands of the MI6 representative in Shanghai. This representative was very anti-SOE, reads the report. The MI6 officer feared a breach in security by the amateurs that would have led to his own exposure to the Japanese. MI6 actively tried to destroy OM Shanghai through its control over communications and was quite successful in this regard. The choice of targets for the new fledgling OM Shanghai to choose from was diverse. An unusual sight would have confronted visitors who arrived by ship in Shanghai in 1941. At the north end of the Bund sat the British consulate housing the embassy since the rape of Nanking, the Union Jack fluttering proudly in the stiff onshore breeze. A few buildings down the street, visitors would have seen the Nazi swastika flag snapping out just as proudly in the wind. Enemies, separated by only a few hundred yards of settlement. Shanghai was neither colony nor Chinese city, but instead a neutral slice of territory, controlled by a council dominated by the British and Americans, and peopled by a polyglot mixture of Europeans, Chinese, Japanese and Russians. No single power held sway, so although Britain and Germany were at war, diplomatic niceties were still being observed. Swinging on their anchor cables in midstream, the Italians maintained several warships on the Huangpu River, easily observable from the many British businesses that lined the Bund and from the Shanghai Club. Such proximity to one's enemies galvanized Gan's group to begin plotting a bold attack on the Axis. OM Shanghai had been issued with four main objectives by Killery in Singapore, the second of which read, Organize sabotage of enemy interests, such as shipping, enemy goods, wireless broadcast propaganda, etc. Killery ordered Gan to start compiling lists of enemy goods in Shanghai and their destinations when moved. If these goods could then be sabotaged, so much the better. Enemy ships were also to be targeted for destruction, and a propaganda campaign was to be initiated against the Axis. OM Shanghai seized upon the task of attacking enemy shipping, though quite how they expected to do this when none of the group at any commando or sabotage training was not addressed. Several plans were considered. Blocking the river was one idea, but although the Huangpu is quite narrow, at least three ships would have been required to shut down traffic. Another idea was to sink ships as obstructions. And there was a final daring plan which was adopted, much to the horror of the Foreign Office, which was an attack on the Italian colonial sloop Eritrea that was moored close to the Bund. The Eritrea was a modern, well-armed warship. At the same time, an effort was to be made to nobble a Nazi reporter named Karl von Wiegand, who was filing articles for William Randolph Hearst's US publishing empire that were damaging Britain's reputation in the city. OM Shanghai went ahead with planning an attack on the Eritrea, recently arrived from Kobe after the Japanese had refused her captain permission to intercept Soviet convoys in the Pacific. The Royal Navy was behind Gan's plan, even though the Royal Navy's warship presence in Shanghai had shrunk to one partially manned gunboat and a tug, everything else having been evacuated to Hong Kong and Singapore in 1940. MI6, however, was annoyed at SOE muscling in on its field of operations and actively tried to block the scheme with the connivance of the Foreign Office. OM Shanghai's attempts at provoking a new war front in Shanghai were to be severely tested as the Foreign Office balked at launching military operations on what was effectively neutral territory. The FO feared that attacking Japan's allies would provoke the Japanese into occupying Shanghai and beginning a war with Britain. Gan's plan to sink the Eritrea had entered the final stages before suddenly the operation was abruptly cancelled by order of Killery in Singapore. Killery had been pressured by the Foreign Office to stop the operation and complied. 
We have very large interests there and no means of protecting them, wrote the Foreign Office to OM headquarters in Singapore in reference to Shanghai. It would therefore be rash for us to disturb the virtual truce now existing in the international settlement, which though Chinese soil has always enjoyed a quasi-neutral status. The diplomats had revealed themselves as men of straw, and MI6 had proved a greater danger to OM Shanghai than the local representatives of the Nazi powers. Gand and his colleagues were devastated, but the cancellation probably saved their lives. Seven middle-aged men attempting to board and sink a fully armed warship in the midst of a peaceful city may have descended into farce, or more likely have resulted in a massacre. The Eritrea, along with the other Italian vessels, remained untouched and safely moored on the Huangpu River until the Italian armistice in September 1943, when Italy dramatically changed sides. The Eritrea dashed successfully to Colombo in Sri Lanka and surrendered to the British, while the crews of the other Italian vessels scuttled their ships and went into Japanese prisoner of war camps in Shanghai for the duration. However, it was realized by SOE that when the Japanese took over the international settlement and joined the Axis, Gand and his men would still not know the first thing about sabotage. With this disturbing fact at the forefront of his mind, John Brand travelled to Singapore in August 1941 to receive explosives and sabotage training at STS-101, and Gan was given £5,000 as a working budget for OM Shanghai. Incredibly, the money was remitted through the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank, the HSBC on the Bund, and when the Japanese liquidated HSBC after their takeover of the city, the entry was discovered in a ledger, and the Kempei Tai informed. The Kempei Tai confiscated Gan's OM budget and used the cash to finance their operations in Shanghai. It was an astounding example of incompetence, and indicative of the well-meaning but amateur nature of British intelligence operations in Shanghai. Unfortunately, OM Shanghai completely underestimated the ability of their arch-rivals, the Kempei Tai. The Japanese had occupied all of Shanghai except the international settlement and the French concession since 1937. But even within the international settlement, dominated by the British and Americans, the Kempei Tai was running an efficient intelligence-gathering network, operating out of the Japanese concession located across Suzhou Creek in the Hongkou district. For several weeks prior to the Japanese takeover, the Kempei Tai had gathered information about OM Shanghai. The Japanese knew that OM was an intelligence organization linked to the British Ministry for Economic Warfare, and this information had come to them through another elementary mistake made by an OM member. Gand kept certain secret files relating to his organization in his safe at work, and incredibly, other employees also had access to that safe. One employee, a Romanian, stole several of these files after recognizing their value and sold them to the Japanese. The Kempei Tai then covertly organized the tapping of Gan's telephone and recorded all of his conversations, both with his superiors and with his agents. OM Shanghai's days were numbered. As the Shanghai Volunteer Corps, the expatriate volunteer military organization recruited in Shanghai, and the Shanghai Municipal Police geared up for possible war in December 1941, and as the relocated British Embassy anxiously monitored events, the Foreign Office, MI6, and SOE's Far Eastern representatives did nothing. In an appalling piece of bureaucratic indifference, Gand and his associates were given no further instructions by London or Singapore and were abandoned to a terrible fate. Once the city was about to be overrun by the Japanese, it was too late to get Gand and his men out. Their only hope was to keep a low profile and try to pass themselves off as what they appeared to be pillars of settler society, leaders of expatriate business. Betrayal and arrest were now distinct possibilities for all seven men. 
You have been listening to Shanghai Spies, researched, written, and presented by Mark Felton. For many short history documentaries on a wide variety of subjects, visit my other YouTube channel, Mark Felton Productions. You can also help support both of my channels, PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below. <laughs> <laughs>